Good, thanks Sue, and it's, it is good to see so many people here today. Just before I introduce these two, brother and sister, um, a word uh, firstly about our get together on the 30th of July. Now it seems a long way off. And uh, in the room we have uh, Stan Keo. Stan, would you just like to stand up for a minute if you don't mind? It doesn't matter that you didn't shave this morning. Stan. Okay. Good. So, thanks, Stan. Okay. Now, on the um, Saturday, the 30th of July, um, Stan is very heavily involved with the Masonic Lodge that uh, most of you know where it is, just next to Highmarsh Park. And it's very unusual that the ordinary person gets access to what happens at the lodge. And that's exactly what's going to happen um, uh, on the 30th of July, Saturday the 30th of July. Like a lot of things, it was put off from, was it last year or the year before, when it, they were celebrating their 150th anniversary um, of lodge operations in Kiama, which is quite an achievement. So on that day, it's two o'clock as I remember it, Stan, and uh, our, our members uh, certainly um, uh, we're asking if they notify Stan, and um, and if anybody here today thinks they would be interested in that day, as I understand it, it's free, but it'll be interesting, but perhaps you could, um, now you know what Stan looks like, he's that good looking bloke there, I'm sure you can give him a pen and a bit of paper, and he can put you on a list so that um, you can um, be on that list for that day. Um, for the meetings beyond that, we'll, uh, we'll put out a, um, through to our membership, um, the meetings uh, through the, uh, the remainder of the year after July, but obviously that's still a little way off. Now that brings me to today, to welcoming Gail Taylor um, and Gary, where to go? Gary Marks, okay, and you'll see more of Gary in a moment, Gail's standing here. Now Gail, just before she comes over here and Gail is very, very keen to get going today, I know that, but I, I also want to say something about um, the role of a person who, who looks for people to be our speakers. I've done it for a while, a few years, and it's an interesting job. It, it's a little bit actually like fishing. You, you put a line in the ocean and um, you, you, you make little suggestions, you put out a little bit of bait to people and you hope that they'll take the bait. And some say, yes, uh, I'm happy to be a speaker or um, maybe I'll do it in another year. Now I started fishing uh, for <laughs> these two as speakers because I thought, well, really, most of us in, in a relative term are blowing to Kayama. We're relative newcomers. We are obviously, most of us, interested in the history of the place. But some people have been here for decades, generations. And uh, we've had a number of those, of course, in, in previous meetings, and they've been great. And, uh, but I'd have to say, probably the greatest challenge of all has been to get these two to get speak to one of our meetings. I think I can really say that. It goes back quite some years that I first sowed the seeds and Gail's nodding ahead here because I thought, well, you know, you've got to get people while they're alive and fit and well. Now, they're only youngsters. <laughs> they're only youngsters, but having said that, um, they were even younger when I started suggesting they might like to speak to us. So they're finally here and uh, and certainly, uh, there's probably a few others like them around the place that I, if I can think of between now and the end of the year, and certainly um, I'll throw out a line to them. But for the moment, uh, uh, we're very, I'm very pleased today to finally get you here. I know you put a lot of thought into it, and I'm sure it's going to be a really, really interesting uh, afternoon. So Gail, Gary, uh, brother and sister, uh, you can argue who's going first. I know you've worked it all out. You started your arguments years ago, but anyway, they're great. So, who do I hand the microphone first? I prefer not to use a mic. Can well, you all hear me? Well, uh, we would prefer that you did use it, yeah. Thanks, Gary. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm Gary John Marks, and uh, I'd like to introduce, first of all, we're speaking about a property called Terragong, and Terragong has been uh, part of our Jamboree forever. And the name Terragong really means where two rivers meet, because there's a Jurera Creek meets the Minamara River. And all of the land that has been flooded for so long in the last few months is the Terragong Swamp. So whether, whether you 
whether we can realise whether the name Terragon came from the swamp or the, the property's name went to the swamp, I'm not quite sure. But there's a real history in that piece of land alone. So I was born into a dairying family in the early 50s and that farm had been operating close to 100 years. So I was born with history at foot. And I'd like to leave it there and Gail is going to fill us in a bit on the actual family. History. History. <laughs> there you go. Hello, yes, I'm Gail. Um, I'm the eldest of three. Uh, the, it's Gail, I'm Gail and Gary and we have a younger brother Wayne who's three years younger and we're fifth generation of the Marxes. And we say so our sixth one are our children and our seventh one are our grandchildren. And that's as far as we've gone. Which isn't all that far, considering that the Marxes have been um, in New South Wales for almost 200 years. So the Marx, so I thought I'm, I'm to do the history as quick as I can. <laughs> There's a lot of history. I mean, it's been 200 years, I've got to try and condense. But um, uh, we started, we came to Australia, John Moody Marx came to Australia and he arrived in January uh, not, uh, 1827 and with his wife Elizabeth and they were free settlers they've been encouraged to come out and uh, take up land and he ended up in the rocks area he was a baker but he opened the um, uh, steam packet hotel in the rocks area one thing about it is they left the oldest son at home in Ireland because he was only two and they didn't feel he could travel, so he stayed. And the next son, John, who was one of the original, who eventually built Terrigal, he came. He was only a really tiny baby, and he arrived still as a baby. They then had um, twins, Robert and Margaret. Then they had Samuel, who's our great grandfather. James Moody Marks was our great great grandfather. So it's not that many generations. So our great grandfather was Samuel, and then there was James. That's all that there were. So um, after a few years, James Moody Marks got a crown grant of 50 acres at Jamboree in 1935. So we've been in this area since 1935. I'm sorry, am I saying that? I did a little bit. 1835, of course, 1835. So he came out in 35. And um, after, and next door was Malcolm Campbell, who was an overseer of convicts. And he'd done a lot of work with the convicts, and he died in Sydney in James Moody Marks' Team Packet Hotel. So James Moody thought he claim against his estate for board and lodgings, and they gave him 250 <laughs> acres. <laughs> so, he, he, so that is Terragong, that's how we got the land. And at the same time, in about 1843, he opened the Steam Packet Hotel in Coma, which is where the Brighton is. That's where the Steam Packet Hotel was. So that's, uh, that's that part. I can skip 20 years now. Um, and, in, um, and then, so then John became a member of Parliament in 1856 and he and his brother James, the younger one, they married two very wealthy sisters from, Je from Sydney. They owned the Strand Arcade and John's wife was a widow and she had an income of £10,000 a year. Now that's, you know, she was just wealthy. So that's why he built Terragong. It might be why, but I mean he was able to build Terragong. So he built Terragong in 1858, and James at the same time built Culwalla. Now a lot of, lot of people don't know about Culwalla. It's up on top of the hill. It's similar to Terragong. It was only one level, but now it's got a second story and it's got fantastic views. And that went out of the out of our uh, the Marx family about 1890, out of the Marxes. But they were they they did. So the two brothers, as I said, uh, they were great people for the town, especially John. John was the mayor here. He was a member of parliament in the lower house and later on in the upper house. They helped build the main school here. They built um, the Presbyterian church. When I say they, I mean as far as giving money. And they uh, built the cottage hospital up in Barney Street. They're just some of the things I know that they did as well. And um, so, so things went on. And in 1876, John and James retired to Sydney, which he did. And Samuel, who's our great-grandfather, he was living at a place called Marksville. They called it Marksville. And it was over at Albany Park. It's on the southern, the western side of the airport, right there. That was Marksville. It's still called Marksville. And he moved across, and he lived into Terragong. So that's where our direct link starts. And he, um, he never, ever owned Terragong. He only ever rented it from his brother, 
and from his brother's estate. That's right, yes. So I'm really into the 1900s. Anyway, um, around, I thought I'd just mention two things about um, the twins, Robert and Margaret. Now, Margaret was 17 and she, got, she married a fellow only 20 years older than her, a, a king. And she then had 14 children in 20 years, as they did. And I don't know where things would have gone, but fortunately or unfortunately, he had, a, when he was riding his horse, he had an a epileptic fit and fell off and died. So from 37, she didn't have to have any more children. So that was good, so that was one thing. And Robert, Robert was her twin, he married into the Kendalls, you know, Brule and Bonero, where we are with the new, there, the Brule house there. And he married Jane Kendall from there. And he was only married seven years, and she died of measles at the age of 29, and left five children under the age of seven, including a two-month-old. So it was, it was terribly a woman in those days. And anyway, so her, those five children were brought up at Brule, because that was where the grandmother lived. So that was that. And when she died in 1905, and she's buried in the Kendall Cemetery, the special cemetery, the family cemetery, uh, she died there. And uh, when Robert heard that she died, he said, there's nothing more to live for. And he died within a fortnight. So they just both died at the age of 75, which is a good age. And that's it. So, right, I'm up to this year. I'm going quicker. <laughs> and so then, so Samuel's in Tarragon. Um, and then um, our grandfather, Ernest, was living at left the road, and he bought the property from the John's estate. So even though Samuel never owned and lived there, he then, and he moved to Tarragon about 1907. And uh, Ernest had eight living children in uh, 13 years, and um, my our dad, uh, Cedric, who we call Dinky, he was born in 1911 there. So he was a, that's a drinkling. And then of course, it went on, the grandfather died in 1925, and the three brothers, there were three brothers, uh, ran the farm, and then dad finally married in the not, late 1948 to Agnes Murphy from Jamboree, who was one of eight. And um, they then, I must mention this, they didn't know if they were going to do, what they were going to do with Terragong. By that time, it was in a terrible state. Uh, and Dad and Ned had been living there, my Uncle Ned, who's Brian, but they call him Ned. He was, uh, they'd been living there as bachelors for seven years, so it was in a really poor state. <laughs> and they, they had to decide, and so whether they'd abandon it or build and build, or so that my father, mother and father decided they'd do it up. So for the next 40 years, my mother spent her whole life doing it up. She always had a project in mind. She did everything. Amazing what, what she did. And so then we came along in the 50s, and we grew up there in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then Gary and Wayne went and worked on the farm with um, Dad and Ed because one brother had died. And then we leased it. I think I'm up to that. We leased it in 19... It, it, 19... 90. I've got it right, yep. Yeah. We leased it in 1990 and finally sold it in 2014 to Simon and Daryl who have um, completely done it up. They have now made it like um, South, it's New Southampton style. It's not... And uh, it's a beautiful B and B with three bedrooms, and they also do weddings, and it's been saved. It really has been. We still own some land at the moment, Gary Wayne and I, which we're about to, we own 100 acres and another 22 acres, and um, we're going to put that on the market shortly. But that's to the eastern side of Terragon, which was really what so. So I think I covered it. <laughs> that's all, yes. I think that's the whole. I didn't miss any of the things I wanted to say, no? Okay, Gary, your turn. I'm actually lucky I've got Gail because she's really interested and it's great. Um, growing up on the farm, I wasn't particularly interested in history, neither was my dad or uncle Ned, you've heard about because they were just too busy dairying, and that's been the mainstay of uh, Terrible, is dairy. Um, our um, grandfather, Ernest Marx, you can see some of the photos around here, he helped develop the Illawarra Shorthorn breed, and uh, they were two Shorthorn cattle crossed with air shares, and it was really Australia's first breed that they had developed themselves. And um, they were leaders there, and, and they showed in the kind of show 
1908, 1910. And uh, I think it really ended because, as you heard, uh, our grandfather died pretty early, really, in 1925. So I was unlucky never get to meet my granddad. Apparently, uh, sorry, excuse me. Apparently, he was quite a guy because he traded in cattle, uh, helped an enormous number of people out because of, with financing, and he was directly interested in most things and a, an avid reader. Because in Terragong there was a, quite a large library, a couple of thousand books, and I understand that he had, never went further than primary school. So. He must have taught himself an enormous amount. Um, as we moved on, we, we decided um, my uncle died on the farm uh, early on, and uh, my other uncle, who whose name was Brian or Ned, he lived with us. He never married. So my mum looked after two men, my dad and uh, Brian, most of her life. And I take my hat off for anyone doing that and they decided to buy our other partners out uh, the brother who had passed away so we did that in the late 80s and the farm was then saved could have, could have been sold again at that time and uh, when my uncle died he left the farm to my father so that's how we've maintained the heritage otherwise at all, all those events it would have had to be sold so at the moment um, I think I might pass back to Gail. I want you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I won't say too much. <laughs> uh, um, as I said, I had a few different... Because they, they asked that we would talk about us growing up in Terragong, you know. A, but things blended because of the generations and nothing ever changed. It just sort of blended in and, and there weren't many things that, that you can recall as happening, you know, at a particular time because... But anyway, so... Um, as I said, you know, Gary and Wayne at school, then they're on the farm, and it's just kept going, things like that. But I wasn't the typical farm girl, I better mention it. <laughs> yes, no, I, I had, um, as a matter of fact, I had very little to do with the farm. I only ever went over the bales when I wanted to ask Dad if I could go out. And it was really <laughs> defined. My mother and my role was in the house. We, were, we weren't encouraged. Well, either that or I didn't show any interest. Not sure. <laughs> but I, I, I never had much to do with the farm at all. Just, I just didn't. And um, anyway, but I thought I'd talk about... So where are we? I, I thought I'd talk about um, the, uh, the routines and how we worked it as a farm, you know. It worked well, even though we had my uncle who never married. He's 13 years older than Dad, so he was like a grandfather. And he, how they maintained such great relations, I don't know, between the three of them. It was a big house, but I think people were very respectful of each other somehow, and um, it always worked. Ned, Ned, Ned never interfered with, um, with the disciplining of us somehow, but I don't know how it happened. It just all did. And uh, So we lived, we slept upstairs. Ned moved downstairs after a while. We only ever went upstairs to sleep. That's all we did. We'd take the potty. You had to take a potty because there's no, no other way up there. So you'd take the potty and we'd have hot water bottles and we'd have mosquito nets and um, it, it was very cold. And I remember being a little girl being very frightened because the whole house rocked. And it, all the windows rattled terribly. They fixed up the windows now. That's the new things they've done in the, since well, Daryl's moved in. They still rattle. <laughs> 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 anyway, but I always think that I'm just rattling. So anyway, I remember just creeping down the stairs and saying, you know, being frightened sometimes. But we never, we baked the beds in the morning and we'd come downstairs and we, did, we weren't, our bedrooms weren't used to playing or anything, we just, that's the only time we used. We had a toy room in the front room. The front room we called the toy room, which later became the bedroom. So everything was done downstairs. And um, the meals were a big thing because um, we had to have all the breakfast ready for the men and, then, and the boys then, and over the men coming home. And we had, to, we had breakfast was a, a two, at least two course. And we always had boiled rice. We'd have cereal and then you'd have boiled rice uh, with the salt and pepper, salt and pepper and you know butter, and then we'd have uh, and some sort of meat, and then lunch was just a sandwich, and then dinner. Dinner was vegetables and meat because my uncle Ned had a vegetable garden. It wasn't just an ordinary vegetable garden; it was enormous. And when he didn't like it after a while and felt it didn't have enough nutrients, he just moved the whole thing over, made another one up the paddock again. 
And as he got really old, he was a bit unsteady and he'd fall over. And you could see tints here and there where he'd fallen, you know, in, in that. But we'd sit down to, you know, I, I don't know, 12 vegetables a night, you know, cabbage and cauliflower and carrot and potato and, oh, you know, peas and beans and chocos. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never liked chocos. <laughs> but that's it. We, and, of course, they're all boiled and well, which you did in those days, with the salt and um, with the bicarb soda, you know. <laughs> that's how you cooked it. And so we grew up with really healthy food because that was the way it was. Um, now, what else did I mention? That there's something else, there's something else. I'm just, I'm only talking about the, um, uh, oh, and as I said, of a morning when it was time for the men to get up and go to work at four o'clock, Ned would come to the foot of the, the, the front hall and the, the light switch was on a long cord from the very top of the ceiling upstairs. That was the landing lot. We called it the landing where you went. And he'd switch it on and off. Oh, oh, did he get up, Ninky? Whoa, whoa. And he'd just switch it on and off and on and off. And that's how he woke that up, didn't he? Yeah. Remember doing that? And me. And you. <laughs> later on you. Yes, this is it. See, things blend in. It's the same. So, um, okay, I think I've said all I wanted to say about that, Gary. I think. Just me sleeping. I've talked about the sleeping. And I've talked about that. Yes. Okay, your turn. <laughs> you can see that things were defined by a home and uh, it was the most unusual house to have. And people used to think, I guess, the, but that we were wealthier than we really were. And it was a very difficult uh, thing at some times because people had fairly high expectations in that way. But uh, only from her mum and uh, her abilities, uh, she could make curtains, she could uh, wallpaper, she could measure carpet, and uh, my dad and my mum laid the carpet, if you could believe that, uh, in the stairs, going up to the stairs, which was, was a very difficult job, I can tell you. And uh, the work, yeah, it was great, because they weren't trained in those sorts of things at all, uh, uh, and were able to do it. And uh, the furniture that was in the house was passed down, of course, and it was period furniture. So growing up, I started to look at this furniture, which was mostly Australian red cedar. So I decided that I might have a go at doing some of it up. So I did. So I did. Because most of it was black stained, and that was done, I think, around the 30s, late 20s and 30s. That was the thing to do, was to black stain everything. And Simon would know a lot, a lot about that. <laughs> and uh, so I decided to do. So I, I got an interest in it. It was great. It was really great. I, I've done quite a lot: tables, chairs, bureaus, and it was a great thing to help me to get a, a break away from the farm, a break away from cows. Because one thing about dairying, it's seven days a week, <laughs> and seven days a week can get to you sometimes. Um, we you only remember ever milking the missing milking the cows ourselves a couple of times back in the 70s we had some huge floods uh, floods that were even bigger than the ones we've just recently had bridges washed away uh, really and we could not actually get from Terragong to our dairy which was only what 200 meters away but across a creek and uh, I remember watching that day whole trees being washed down and cattle being washed out too. And uh, most of the cows that got washed away got saved because they're pretty good swimmers. They were really good swimmers. Um, we also, we um, had a lot of people calling in from every area saying that we would know such and such a person because we'd been in the area a long time. And mostly we had never heard of them, of course, but they think, they thought we knew we should know. So early on, Gail and I went up to the Mitchell Library and started to learn about family history. And that's where we learnt it from. And uh, our, some of our forebears had quite a lot written about them because they're fairly important people. But I'd like to emphasise the, the place of my direct family, mother, father and uncle, played because without them, it wouldn't have been there and the house would have been lost. Uh, people... Um, wouldn't have been so close knit because the house drew most of our cousins down to join us while we're, 
while we were living there. We played many a game of cricket, many a game of football, you name it, we played it. Back to you, Gap. Yes, as I said, am I online? Yes, of course my mother was one of, um, I said, seven sisters. Um, and they were very close because their mother died when the elder sister was 16. I didn't say this before, did I? No. She died when, when the elder sister was 16 and she died in childbirth and, um, and lost twins as well. And so there was eight children under 16. So the older girls brought up the younger ones. So my mother and the sisters were extremely close all the time. So we were very close to our cousins and we still are in a lot of contact with those cousins. We spent our holidays together and we played games. We did play Cowboys and <coughs> Indians. Do you remember Gary? Yes. We played all sorts of games like that. We had forts and we had cubby houses because there was enough, enough, of, enough of us to do that. <coughs> um, I was going to mention the event of uh, when, when television came because that made an enormous difference to the farm, as I said, everything had gone along. We got television in 1959, <coughs> and my, mo my mother had heard that you can't sit too close to television, so she knocked the wall out. <laughs> and, she, <laughs> and she made the bedroom and the dining room into one big lounge room. The best thing she ever did, because then we always had lots of room. And, um, and so that's what they decided. Before that, well, I didn't mention some of the rude things we did, but all we did before that, I remember, is we used to play dominoes. Every night after tea, we'd have, we'd play dominoes. And sometimes I remember sitting with my father's knee and he'd tell me all these stories. I realised later they had lots of mo um, strong moral learnings later on. And I find I, I, I tell those same stories to my grandchildren later on. But uh, anyway, but if we were very good, we were allowed to sit over on the bench near the wireless no radio, it was called wireless, and we could have our tea in front of the wireless. Like later on, you used to have tea in front of the television. We'd have tea in front of the wireless, and we thought we were made when we did that, and we could listen to Smokey Dawson, I remember one, and things like that. So, so then television came, and um, it was that sort of gradually disappeared. We didn't have that anymore. That was one thing. And I have another thing here I want to mention about my brother Wayne. Um, he uh, He's not here today, but uh, he's. Uh, when he was born, he was born with a club foot. A uh, club foot's where your foot's turned right in like that. And uh, it was devastating for mum and dad uh, uh, when that happened. And um, um, in the, he had an operation within a fortnight and they stretched, sewed it straight and he had, his legs were in plaster and he had a wire, a, a steel bar across the bottom to keep him straight. And he learned to walk like that, he jumped. He was a, he'd jump in his playpen. And later, and then he, oh, yes. Like, and then he had um, operations, uh, to, and each time they're trying to um, bring down the ligaments of the leg, he wore a leg on his whole primary school and had his last um, operation when he was 13. Uh, later on, later on, he'd be, he couldn't play t cr cr uh, football like Gary, so he got on to martial arts and he played taekw did taekwondo. He became the fourth Dan Black Belt. He became a Southeast Asian referee, and he had his own classes up at Kaima in the hall at Kaima High School for years. So he, he found his way. But they decided what had gone wrong, you know, why did it happen? And they later on they thought maybe it was because of my father's blackberry spray. Dad used the blackberry spray with the um, the black with the um, you know tank on the back. And um, he was doing a lot of that in the 19, late 1940s, 1950s. I was born with some bone deformities, a toe that didn't grow, and extra lumps and things too. And uh, they found out that it was called 245T. It was a chemical in the spray, and that's the spray they used in Vietnam when they were doing all that defoliation. Mm -hmm. And uh, some Vietnam veterans came home, and they had children with club feet. So we think maybe that's what happened there. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> so growing up uh, I had some expectations to be fairly good at sport <laughs> because um, my dad, he was a renowned uh, cricket player and also a rugby league player. He actually had played against on Bradburn, so I thought, well, he, he'd done something. And he, he held quite a lot of the records here. Uh, he also had 
some records of hitting a cricket ball out of the Kaima showground uh, towards the road, bounced onto the road apparently, so he could actually get a, get a hold of them. And most of those cricket games were held where you had to hit the ball up because the grounds weren't kept like they are now. They were long grass. Um, so I had a high expectation of being a, a fairly good sportsman, but that didn't come to be. Uh, <laughs> it didn't happen. But uh, So I changed from being a right-hander to a left-hand cricket player. I had a bit more luck in rugby league. Um, I did reasonably well in rugby league, but nowhere near what he did. He played for New South Wales country. And, um, and then he went to, um, also did a bit of boxing. He was quite good at athletics, so he's a real sportsman. My other, say father, Uncle Ned, he was renowned in the community and he actually started um, the vet service for, for dairy farmers that couldn't get a vet in the area. They, they weren't able to get vets, so they developed a scheme between the local co-ops and they bought houses and supplied vets with cars, and that's how the veterinary practices started here in Kaima, Berry, Turingong. Uh, they were run by a, a group of people representing each of the cooperatives, and they did that for quite a long time so that we could get expert help with our dairy herds. Uh, he also was a member of the Jambrew Bowling Club that helped develop the bowling club, and he was uh, a board member on the, the Jambrew Dairy Cop for 40 years. So I had some steps to sort of follow, and uh, I, I think that's the reason we, we stayed there. They were pretty good uh, people to look up to. Yes, Ned was very much a man of the community. He also um, was a member of the Shell Harbour Lions Club. He did that as well. And he's also was very high up in Masons as well. So he, he was always out, out of different things. And my and dad chose to stay home after he finished his, his uh, sporting career. He just decided to stay home then. So, but I also must mention talking about things. My mother, one of, she had made her living as a dressmaker in her earlier days. So there was always sewing going on with all these sisters. But um, one of the things my mother did was she was um, she trained the debutantes balls. Now they were a big thing in those days, and she trained Debs for over 40 years. And she'd be going to you know, training Debs in Jeringong, Shell Harbour, Alvin Park, Iama, Jambrew, and I go along sometimes for that. So, but she did. I thought it was only happening in Jambrew. And one other thing I thought of the other day too was about the bus. I caught Gary and I and Wayne caught a bus to Jambrew School, and then later on to high school, and I moved back there to live nearly 40 years later, and um, Julian and Murray uh, uh, got the bus to primary school and into high school, and it was the same bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Woods Jim. drove those buses for over 40 years. So I thought it could only happen in Jambrew, a place like that. Did you do that? <laughs> now, the other thing I was going to mention was holidays. Being on the farm, there were no holidays. He was there. But we had, because they were so memorable and we did have one, we went to Leeton as a family in our big Humber Hawk. We would have had the Humber Hawk then, yes. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in the back seat. Wayne was only a, a few months old in his bassinet. And Gary sat on an Armit's biscuit tin between mum and dad in the front seat. That's where he sat. We went all the way to Leeton, which in those days was a long way. So I always remember we had one other holiday when I was 12 and we went to Service Paradise for a month. But you didn't have much time off the farms, you know. They had a milker that came once, one milking an afternoon. That's all we had, and, and who would so they take it in turns to, to have the afternoon off. So that was one thing too. Um, the other thing I thought I might have mentioned was the pictures. Uh, so I mean, um, we called it the pictures. Now you call it, they call it the movies. And uh, Jambrew always had pictures when we were growing up. And in the afternoon you go to the football, the family, and at night time you go to the pictures, which was held in the Jambrew Jambrew Big Hall in Jambrew. And you always saw two pictures and you saw a cartoon and you sometimes saw the movie tone news. And um, I was always scared, scared of pictures too, and I spent half my time in the supper room looking through the window because I was scared. I was, I was in the pictures. I was always in there doing you know, whatever they were doing. But at half time, we'd, um, the shops would open, the two shops, and we'd go and get our ninepence. I had ninepence to spend, and I'd buy some peanuts, I remember, for my ninepence. 
uh, you got some more things to say? Yeah, one bit more. Um, well, a bit more. Oh, well, I don't have game to time either. Right, okay, you can, you can talk. <laughs> As you can see on the table here, we've got quite a little bit of memorabilia. That's because Terragong was large, we were able to, to keep it. And um, I remember when we were finally selling Terragong, I thought I knew what was there, but I really had no idea. And there's an enormous amount of papers. Uh, I think I've got something like 30 newspapers, which this is one of and they're mainly rural type papers, 1911 I'm talking about, and so it's, it's a while ago. Um, also books in the library, and I've got a, a couple of books there. One of the books is my grandfather's. He went to Jurera School. I don't know whether people realise there was a, a school at Jurera. Uh, he went there for his schooling. And the other one is also him at Shell Harbour Primary School. Because of his father, Gail mentioned before that he had Marksville over at Albion Park and he was born there and went to school in Shell Harbour. So it would have been very early on, we're talking about early 1870s and uh, so it's a while back and uh, it's great to have those books there and that's what made me realise he, he must have been really well read because of the books there, the, the detail of that they go in, we've got exploration books, we've got books on just about everything and that's how they would have learned. Uh, we also have an interesting collection on prison discipline in the book section and we think that's because of the history of our ancestors being in Parliament and that gives us detailed information about what the convicts were sent, sent to Australia for and also about the prison systems how they were building them. Uh, we also, they also collected, you know, all Charles Dickens, all that type of works, anything that was of interest uh, that they had and we've still got. So what to do with some of these things is quite, uh, it's a bit of a problem, actually, it's a bit of a problem. They want, people are downsizing now and a lot of this and I've got a problem especially with some of the furniture that we took out of uh, Terragon, what, who is going to use it or want it. Beautiful timber, Australian red cedar, beautiful, beautiful things, but uh, where they'll go in the future is another thing. Also, I'd like to mention about a, a couple of incidents. I thought, you know, what, when you're living on a farm and you're milking cows, we were milking 100 cows twice a day, um, it sort of blends in a little bit, but I can remember in the early 60s, before I was working, we had an earthquake and it was based in Robertson. And uh, I can remember jumping out of bed and I thought Terragong was coming down and all the cornices were coming off and a big crack came over the staircase while we were standing in, on the landing and I didn't know whether, I was gonna to say to my mum, she was there, will we jump out the window? I didn't know what to do. <laughs> uh, but no, it stopped thankfully. But that revealed to us how the cantilever steep the staircase has actually built. They actually supported it from the roof. It's got a huge wooden beam across across the building, and a bit couple of big steel rods that come down through the wall. They were all exposed during this this earthquake, and so we had to get a specialist guy in to fix that. And and it we had another one in the early 70s, nowhere near as bad as that one, didn't affect the house, but it really upset our cattle. I can remember we were milking and the cows virtually jumped out of the, where they were held up waiting to be milked. They, they really reacted and they stampeded away. And Anyway, we, we rammed them up again, but it was just a, a big incident that happened. Um, also some of the floods. We had floods sometimes five a year, six a year. So you'd fix up your fences and down they'd come again. Yeah, we, till this last really wet time, as everybody's experienced, we hadn't had some, some big wets for a long time. And the last one I really remember was 89 before this last one. We've had floods, but not, not big ones. And this 
last one was very big, as you, you all know, but 89 was another major wet time. Of course, cows and wet weather don't really get on. They really don't. And we had some major range of health is issues within the herd. Anyway. Well, going on with that, Gary, I, I'm, I could bring in the dam. Yeah. Yes, the dam. Yes, yeah, so um, because, um, as I said, we had Dreary Creek, is the creek that floods. Um, the it was the local council too. The local council decided in the middle of the 1950s that they would build a big dam um, for a water supply for Kiama. Now, all the farmers said to them, the water's not good enough, you know, it's the water that's coming down Durera Creek and it's not, it's not, it's definitely not good enough. But anyway, they went ahead and they built Durera Dam, which at the time was the biggest earthen wall dam in the southern hemisphere, that's what they said it was. And they filled it and guess what, they couldn't use the water. <laughs> so, so Durera Dam sat there for all those years, from 1956, um, and we lost our main water supply on the de on that. So they gave us what they call riparian rights, which meant we got f sort of free water for the next 20 years, sort of thing. That's how it worked. I've got that right, haven't I? Yes. Yes. Anyway, so that was okay. So the dam, the dam wasn't used for anything. And then the council, uh, a few, about maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago, put in some tables and chairs and some walks around it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the dam still sat there. And then we, well, after that um, Grantham in Queensland where uh, the dam wall broke or something and people were swept away, they decided to reassess all the dams. And they decided that Dreary Dam wasn't safe. We'd only been there for you know, 60, 70 years, but it's not safe. <laughs> so then there was only three places involved. Uh, the Wells is at the bottom of the dam, Terragong, and one other place, I think, yes, there are two places there, that's all. That, and the one in Dreera that were affected. So we were to get these alerts whenever we had too much rain, because they were afraid that the dam was going to overflow, you know, or break, you know, a break over. And um, that hasn't, didn't happen, but just the same, we did get the alerts. The first time we got the alert, I, I left home and <laughs> overnight, but that was all. And then, um, anyway, then they decided the council, they either had to come up three metres, or it wasn't a metre, it was three metres. They had to come up three metres um, and it was going to cost them over millions of dollars. So they decided to get rid of the dam and they, they um, you know, dug up, you know, put a, a what is it, a, a crack? A hole, whatever you like, in the dam, so the water would run out. The water would run, and there's still some water there, but it's nowhere near the dam it was. So that's the talk of the dam. Yes. Uh, okay. Why do I have that there? I mean, um, so that's the main things. Yes. I think I've talked. I think I've talked about most. Right. I'll finish up. Right. Um, the main things is I, I have to, I, I will just mention that. Uh, seeing the stands here, I noticed too. Um, I said that John Marks and, and no, Samuel Marks by then, who's you know, Samuel, our, our, grandfather, our, grand, our great grandfather, was very involved in, uh, they were all involved in things around the town. And so when the um, hospital was built, they put in a time capsule. The hospital, this is up at the end of Barney Street, was the Kaima Cottage Hospital. And uh, then when they were, when I think my friend Stan was doing renovations, they found the time capsule. And this letter was in it. Now, um, uh, the people that are in it is my, my grandfather and my uh, grandfather on my great grandfather on the other side, the majors, who was another talk again to talk about the majors. But anyway, because they owned the shops here in time and did all sorts of things here, and they, my great grandmother, by the way, planted the big fig tree in 1860. So that's another side. That's the other side to talk about. But um, anyway, so they then presented my mother, and they presented Mrs. Simmons, who was still alive, and Mrs. Weston, who was still alive, and we all, they each got one of these um, plaques uh, in memory of that time capsule, because they were the only the names that were still left in the in the community. And uh, then I think they replanted another time capsule. So that's why that's there. Um, that's about the main things to talk about. I'm finished. Yeah, that was the finish. Okay. I'll <laughs> Go on. Ask the same yeah, that's the one thing I was going to ask. Is for, but I was just going to fill in a little bit about because uh, being a part of the community, I know a lot of people are being part of Jamboree community. But the big part of the community was taking milk to the factory. Oh, and, we didn't talk about that. Yeah, no, uh, mi milk was 
being delivered. And in the beginning, by horses, and there was races, of course, with the horses to take the milk to the factory. Most producers were only producing five or six cans of milk. So then a milk can was 10 gallons. Uh, and so, and they had, had to be there first and they'd get in line. And later on, trucks came, of course, and it was a bit similar with trucks, and trucks came. We never had a truck, I'd, and we were probably the largest supplier at, for, a, for a long time. We had 25, 30 cans of milk every day. So we were f milking a fair few cows uh, for the area at that time. But, uh, and then the next innovation was bulk milk came in and that's where we refrigerated on site. And most people would know about that. But the difference in the Jamboree community was that because of that flat land, swamp land, and uh, for a long time that could only be leased at 20 acres at a time. They built, you saw the, you see the little sheds on it and they were dairies and they were relief dairies for the farmers. So they give their home farm a break and they developed a portable milk tank. And that's, I think, one of the few places in Australia would have done that. So they could get their milk back, put it behind their tractor on wheels and have it so they plugged it in down on, on their swamp block. And uh, that lasted, quite some time, but it's, it's all changed now. I think there's only one dairy being operated on that swamp now, I'm, I'm sure of that, one, one dairy that's still still operating down there. So it's a huge change, and there, over the years, over the century or so it was going, there was some really quite disturbing incidents with people trying to get access to that land. And uh, it, it it really caused quite a lot of concern because everybody wanted it. And I think that will we'll wind it up there and see if anyone's got any questions. Can I ask, yeah. what happened to the clock? Clock. The, the clock. clock. You had a clock you used to clock. have in the morning. Oh, in, the, in the sunset. Oh, oh that's a story. That's stolen. 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 Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We had Tarragon vacant for a while and... Uh, can you had, describe it? So I can describe it, yes, clock. I can describe it, yes. My father bought my mum a clock, Baker-like clock. That was it, a wedding present? Yeah, a wedding present, yeah, Baker-like clock, which is a mantle clock. And there was a first, would have been one of the first electric clocks, although you still wound it up. The electric part of it was the scene. And, the, and the, it had a boat on the scene and the lights changed and the, and the ship rocked. Yes. And then that was it yes. in the clock. Yes, yes, yes. Very unusual thing. Like Very, morning to afternoon. Yeah, morning to afternoon. Yes. Yeah. 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 Someone yeah. decided they wanted it more than us. We lost, didn't lose a lot, but we did lose, we lost We lost that. We lost, <coughs> we lost a, a can of Coke out of the pantry too. Yeah, so probably the most valuable yeah. thing that was. Yes. <laughs> 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 Yes. yes, you were talking about Gerard Creek and Gerard Dam. You couldn't use the water. Why was that? Uh, I think the reason why why it wouldn't uh, once it became what I understand because it's before my time became still uh, that it became stagnant and, and unusual. And I think the farmers knew that um, while it was running, it was fine. Uh, so that's the reason. Once they built the dam, the warm water wasn't moving. It became stagnant and it got to the stage where they, they had pumps, they had everything. They tried it into part of Kaima community. They just couldn't drink it apparently. Again, before my time, but that's what I understand. Um, somebody up the back. Yes. Thanks very much. Oh, thanks, Bonnie. No, that would have been a couple of generations before me, I think. But my mother wasn't that sort of a cook. Great <laughs> 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 right on benches. Well, I'm, I'm obviously older than you are, but we used to visit Bert and Doc Swan. And they had a Macquarie car. Yeah, I know the Swans were, yeah. The mountain. Yeah. And um, I guess that would have been the 50s? Yes, 
Yeah, well, they, of course, the first production of milk was cream, and uh, they used to use bowls. That's what they used. There wasn't a separating machine in the beginning. Um, in my lifetime, we used another electric s separator, and we used to use it to add cream to the milk so we'd get a higher price. <laughs> because that's the way we did it, because we were paid on production, and the production included uh, value from uh, butter fat and protein, those sorts of things. And we used to, uh, there for quite a while, uh, separate a, a few cans of milk and put it all through the other milk so we, we could gain a higher price for our milk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Gail, uh, yeah. do you know what uh, year the uh, Barney Street College Hospital closed because I was born in Stan, 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 tell us. 1930. 1930. Not, went that long, didn't it? And that's the first time I've seen that document just over 20 years. Is it? Yes. When we gave it to you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's on my piano. It's very <laughs> 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 Yes. Um, you mentioned the milk going off the dairy factory. Jamboree. Jamboree Dairy Factory. There was a oh, okay. Jamboree, but there was earlier on there were a lot of factories. There was a factory in Jarera, uh, a cheese factory in Jarera. There were factories at Woodstock. There were factories, yeah, 1800s. Yeah, earlier on, earlier on, long before my time, but there were a lot of factories. The Jamboree factory was there, to, was well there in the 80s. Yeah, oh, yeah. It, closed, it closed about mid 80s, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it used to make condensed milk, mm -hmm. which I always thought was a waste of, but of milk that had the best mm -hmm. cream content, yeah. mm -hmm. richest cream content in where it, in the state, and they made it into condensed milk. Mm -hmm. And they made butter there, didn't they? Butter. Oh, butter was big. Um, um, milk, milk, milk powder. Milk. Uh, Jamboree was fairly innovative dairies, really. Yeah, just Vauxhall was involved in all that. Yes. 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 I'm just going to say that when we were at high school, we now, you know how kids now, they go off excursions all over the place. Our excursion was down to the Jamboree Butter Factory. <laughs> <laughs> and we made ourselves thick on powdered milk. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You talked about the humble hall, but you haven't talked about the big black luxury car. Oh, oh no, but we didn't get on the cars. No, that, that's, that's, that that's is a story. <laughs> yes, I'll just say the first car we had was a, a Humber, uh, was a what I mean, Hudson Super 6, Something. which we got in about 1923. We did find the receipt for that, we just can't find it at the moment. But we had, so we had that car, it was in a, a, a big car, it was one of the first cars in Jambrou, and my Uncle Duke had to go to Sydney for a week to learn how to drive it. Mm -hmm. And so we had that car till 1938. That was the, the biggest car around. And um, then we got a Chevrolet, a black one, one of those big ones with the big round sides, yeah. you know. And we had that for at least another 12 years. So we just one of these receipts here. What do we call it? It's an overhaul. Yeah, we we only overhaul. found that. We just found that yesterday. It's an overhaul of the Chevrolet being completely done up again. And then when we finished with that one, we got the Humber Hawk, a, a great big grey car. And I've got this the story, well, I'll tell that little story, oh, about the flood. I'll tell. You'll tell the flood? Yeah. All oh, right, you'll tell the flood story. Yeah, I've got to say something. I'll come here. No, it was the biggest, <laughs> one of the big things. You, 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 you probably won't believe it, a Humble Hawk is a very heavy car. Sure and uh, my mum, because it had been raining, came up to pick us up from school, which is very unusual, very unusual. And the Himes Creek, bridge, if you know that, in the middle, as you yeah, go out of Jambrew, yeah. the one that is right there, well, we were crossing back from over that, and the water was so high on the far side of it, that it actually washed the car, and it washed the car yeah, off the road, it, yeah. it, into the tennis courts, oh. into, the <laughs> into the tennis courts which were there, and that's what saved our lives, the tennis courts saved our lives. But we, we, um, it, was a, it wasn't an ordinary flood, it was a, a cloud burst, they yeah. called it, and it happened up on the mountain. And the water that went was all where the new over 55s are, yes. and all that. That was that was an enormous 
Yeah, that's flooded. completely like, completely flooded. It yeah, the, uh, none of those houses yeah. would have been left. No. Yeah. They, they, they no. it moved the tennis court clubhouse onto the tennis court, mm. and uh, we just happened to come up against the fence when the car moved up. Mm. And um, so I remember getting out, and all my pencils got washed away. <laughs> <laughs> and they took us up to um, the, the hotel. Yeah, the hotel to get to dry off. Yeah, the old tennis courts. Uh, yeah, the old tennis the old courts, tennis not, the courts. not the new ones. We the were in trouble, ones. we were going down there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a big deal, uh, and cars were a big deal. Uh, later on in life, we were actually very lucky. We won an art union, we supported an art union for a long time because of Wayne with his disabilities. And we actually won a Dodge Phoenix. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, the, the, the black Dodge Phoenix, which was a, a great car, but uh, it didn't have many luxuries really for back no, then. It, it was enormous, you know, one of those big American ones. It, uh, just enormous. And I remember Dad one day was, uh, it had buttons to, to, to move um, gears, little round green buttons. And he was doing this at the Southern Lights one day. Press the wrong button and the car went straight back. <laughs> <laughs> but we had that car. We did a lot of a lot of weddings. Did everyone's wedding? Big black cuts, black. Anyway. So. That was it. I think we one more. How did you get to school? Say again. You said your mum never picked you up. No. Bus. 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 Peter? Yeah. Oh, I'll ask my question standing up so one or two of you might hear it. Um, I have read a bit of literature about the, the dairy factory in Jamboree over the years, and one or two of the lines say it was the first dairy factory in Australia, which I don't know which is true, but you never know. So the question is. Uh, did your family have anything to do with the founding of that dairy factory? And I should just throw in that back then you had to ship your butter or cheese by ship to yes. Sydney, That's right. uh, probably through Kiama. Yes. So tell us about your connection, if any, with the first dairy factory in Australia. Yeah, well, the first dairy factory in Australia was in Pioneer Creek, Spring Creek, as you come into Kiama here. That's where the first dairy factory was. But that mainly the cheese, not butter milk. Oh, it was all cheese. There was no cheese and cream. No, no liquid milk because mm. there it's is too short. There, there, there is a plaque. There's a bucket. There's a there's a bucket. Time capsule in the bucket. Yes. Uh, yes. But that's the first dairy factory. Yeah. And Just out of, out of the out. other dairy factory, which is called Warhead, and that is named after Mr. War, who is War and Jackson, who was a big machinery guy. Uh, that was developed, I'd say, in the late 1890s, somewhere around that. I don't know exactly when it was built, but I know my grandfather uh, and he had a lot to do with actually you know, helping it start and, and all of that. The cooperative movement was a very strong movement all through these daring areas. Mm. There was a, there was also a, a butter factory so called up Terera, you know. No, I just said that one. Did you? No, I, I thought you said. I didn't think you said Terera. I thought you said anyway. And that one, uh, that's we used to supply milk to that one because I read about that. <laughs> <laughs> Terera had its own cricket cricket side at one time. Yes, that's right. Yeah, they had, they had lots of things. Yeah. Rick Stewart. Gail, okay, just quickly, when you went to the pictures. Yes. What were the two shops? Um, they were called Pryors and Joneses then. Was yes, and, and Joneses is Jones. where the antique shop is. Okay. Where the antique shop is, yes. There's a receipt there from both of them. Well, we found some, oh, if anyone wants to look later, we just found some. We've got hundreds of receipts. But these are just a couple, Gary just pulled out. And one's Pryors and one's Joneses. One's in 1944, some in 1925 from, from those places. Mm. Jeff? Uh, in the floods, Water going to no. no. It's just built in the right spot. I don't know. I don't know whether Daryl even knows about uh, Simon knows about this. At the back of Terragon, there was a mound built. It's on uh, his neighbour's land, and I'd say at one stage they did have some problems with water going through Terragon. And if you go up to the Jurera Creek, you'll see a mound that's built quite a large mound that goes for about 100 metres and that actually turns the water as it comes down and it turns the water back across to the left, to, across the flats towards where the old dairy was. And you can see it working and it works enormously well. Right, any, any, yes. Does a Lowry butter come from Jamboree? Not as far as I know. No, a Lowry Street is only a recent, it used to be called George Street, didn't yeah, it? Yeah. So a Lowry Street is more recent. 
But they did sell jamboree butter. Jamboree butter. When I, it mm -hmm. had jamboree, yes, on, it, on the paper, yeah. didn't it? Yes. All right, look, I'd just like to thank Gail <laughs> and Gary very, very much for the talk this afternoon. Brought back a lot of memories listening to the radio before television. The wireless. The wireless. The wireless. The wireless. The wireless. The wireless, the wireless, the wireless, the wireless life with Dexter. All sorts of things. Um, I do talks often on Barul House. And one talk I was doing, Gail just happened to be there. And I was talking about um, Robert Marks and Jane Kendall and how they married and Jane died. And the five, I think it was, grandchildren went to live with Granny Kendall. Mm. And Gail said, we always wondered what happened to those children, where they went. Yeah, it, it wasn't yeah. anywhere written down. I no, it wasn't written yeah. down, but obviously yeah. I think it must have been in one of the Kendall books or something yes. that I yes. found it. Yeah. We're very proud to have, have Gail and Gary in the Historic Society. We've probably got 150 members and we would have less than probably half a dozen what I call born and breds. <laughs> so <laughs> unless you were born here and bred here, you're not a local, <laughs> as you know. And even if we live here for, I've had people who were, you know, ten years younger than me telling me that I wasn't wasn't a local. So anyway, thank you very, very, very much. Don't forget to come out and have a look at some of the things this afternoon. If any of you have any ideas about speakers, I've heard Gary speak about another branch of the Marx family that built. Glenrock School yeah, yeah. at Edgecliff, mm. in, in, which is one of the main buildings in the Ascombe School currently. So there are lots and lots of, so if anybody's got any ideas, please tell us and we will, Gordon can fish them out and <laughs> now stand. <laughs> you, I can see you waving there. Thank you. I'm not a local. But over there is Brian Fuller, <laughs> very quiet. Now he is a local and his ancestors pretty much paid for the cottage hospital that you referred, heard people refer to, which is where I live now. And he's also, his ancestors contributed greatly to the, the Presbyterian Church here. Yes. Um, so he is a local. And Dunmore House. And Dunmore House. That's where they lived, at Dunmore House. And Brian has written a wonderful book on the Fuller, the Fuller history. Yeah. So he's a local. Still get us at the right price. At the right price. Yes. So anyway, look, I, again, I'd just like you acknowledge what it is. things out of the plastic if there's something there's some things you need to look at if you want to look more closely than just look at it please pick them up and have a look up, up at the museum if you haven't been to the pilot's cottage museum you should go we have a cream separator and we have a keg for butter butter used to be packed into wooden kegs taken on the ships to sydney so in the old days even when i was a child you didn't buy butter in a pack you went in and they chopped off a square and wrapped it in greaseproof paper and you took it home. So you'll see all sorts of things up there. Anyway, thank you. So either have a look, join us for afternoon tea. Lovely, and thank you for coming. Thank you.